hello everybody um it's first of all i just want to say how excited and happy i am to see so many people here this evening to uh, to join us um and talk about wasps and um, so i'm liam i am a postdoctoral researcher at the university of oxford and i'm working on the darwin tree of life project where we're trying to sequence the full genome of every single species of eukaryote in britain and ireland um, but I'm also really interested in bees, ants and wasps. Um, and I'm a member of Bee Wars and I'm involved with the data uh, group, uh, the data team at Bee Wars. Um, so for those of you who might not know, Bee Wars is the Bees, Wasps and Ants Recording Society. And we are a recording scheme and organisation that uh, collects and curates records of bees, ants and wasps in the UK. And we have one of the biggest and best databases of its kind in the world. In fact, we have over a million records now in our database, uh, going back to uh, the, the right to the start of the uh, 20th century. Uh, and we still want more records. So um, as part of uh, this talk tonight, I hopefully will encourage um, all of you, um, if you've never recorded a wasp before, then go out and record a wasp. If you, if you have, then record even more. Uh, we can't have too many records, uh, because this data is so useful uh, and valuable for us, particularly in the face of, of climate change. So in this uh, seminar this evening, um, we're going to be focusing in on uh, culiate wasps, and we're going to go through the different uh, families of aculeate wasps that we have in the UK and try and introduce how we can recognise some tips and tricks for, for being out of place. And that will give us a nice overview of what this group of um, insects is like. So to start, we'll look uh, and we'll think a little bit about the biology of these wasps. Uh, then we'll go through all the different families that we have in the UK. Um, and then I'll just uh, a little bit about um, how we can record and identify uh, wasps. And then at the end, uh, we'll have a quiz. Um, and that's just a really yeah, easy, don't, you know, don't be scared, uh, easy multiple choice quiz just to go through and see if we can have a look at some, some nice photos of wasps and, and work out what family it might belong to based on uh, what we've just uh, looked at. So why wasps? Well, one, wasps are just the best animals. That's just that's just a fact. And you, you can tell people I said that. Um, but they have really interesting biology. So they're doing really interesting things. Um, wasps as a group are essentially uh, taking advantage of other animals. So they are predators or parasites uh, or parasitoids or kleptoparasites. Um, and as such, they've evolved really interesting interactions with other species. They also have really interesting uh, links to their environment. So, uh, for example, many, many species are very strongly thermophilic. So they respond to temperature in quite a profound way. So with climate warming, as, as uh, climate change takes hold, uh, we start to see um, them change at, at population and, and country level. Um, and that can be potentially really informative. Now, in recent years, bees have become very, very popular and there's a lot more people recording bees, which is absolutely fantastic. I'd love to see the same for wasps because compared to the bees and compared to other groups, wasps are actually very under recorded and understudied. And there's a lot we can learn from recording and studying them. And there are even amongst this big group, there are some difficult ones, but there are also some uh, very common, very widespread species, which are quite easy to identify. Um, and they're really interesting. And we can go out in gardens and you can look at them and you can record loads of different species just from your garden. Um, and if you're looking for a bit more of a challenge, there are also more difficult groups. Um, there are groups which are incredibly difficult. And, and in fact, even the cutting edge science is struggling to delineate species. So that's where things like uh, molecular, cutting edge molecular science is starting to come in and, and DNA technology, trying to sort out what species of what. So if we're going to go through all the Achilles, um wasps, then we should probably start off uh, by defining what we mean when we say aculeate wasp. So the kind of common name for aculeata could be the stinging wasps. And in the UK, we have about 332 species. Um, across 18 families. Now, the reason that's about, and I can't put a precise number in, is because it's changing all the time. 
the more we study them, the more we realize that there are cryptic species in complexes or the species that we thought they were actually got it wrong and um, the species are organized in a slightly different way. On top of that, they're also a very mobile group with a lot of species arriving in the UK from the near continent um, and almost certainly driven by uh, climate warming. And this group, the stinging wasps, um, includes solitary species. Most of them are solitary species, but it also has a, the full range of different degrees of sociality, sociality all the way up to eusocial, where they have things like um, the uh, Vespula vulgaris, the common wasp, um, which is fully eusocial with overlapping generations, cooperative brood care and sterile worker castes. Um, so I tried to come up with my own kind of definition. If I was writing a dictionary entry under Aculeata, what would I call it? Well, I'd say it's a paraphyletic subclade of Hymenoptera that ancestrally derived a stinger from a modified ovipositor. What on earth does that mean? Well, to answer that question, we have to have some taxonomy. So we'll go back to the early Triassic, and we have this group of insects, the order Hymenoptera first evolving. And the Hymenoptera, the, the very first ones were sawfly-like waspy things um, that laid their eggs in plants. And then the eggs hatch and the larvae then consume the host plant. They grow, eventually pupate, has a full metamorphosis. And then the adult sawfly would then emerge and repeat the, the cycle. Now, a group of these then developed a much more efficient way to gather protein much faster. And instead of eating plants, eating another animal. And in this case, it's another invertebrate. So this is the evolution of the parasitism. So this was probably in the um, Triassic, kind of mid-Triassic uh, period, um, going into the um, early Jurassic. And then from this group, uh, the parasitic sawflies, we then have um the um original um apocrita so these contains all of the bees wasps and ants and there's lots of these this is probably one of if not the most species rich group on the planet there's an incredible diversity of parasitic uh, wasps a particular group of these is um, a particular feature of these, sorry, is the um, evolution of a wasp waist. So this is a constriction between the mid body and the end body, which allows the abdomen to become much more mobile, which is a really handy adaptation if you are parasitic, because you can bring your abdomen round and you can quickly um, lay your egg into or onto your host. So that was a key uh, kind of evolution stage. And that is the easiest way for us today to tell the difference between a sawfly, who are still around as a group, and a, um, a wasp or bee or ant, in that they will have this waste. Then a particular group of these then modified the ovipositor into a stinger. So they put a venom gland at the end, and it was a way then to deliver venom and this is uh, quite a key um, stage again, because this um, provides really useful offense or defense. So offense, um, you can use that stinger to then deliver venom or various a host of biomolecule, biomolecules to your prey, uh, paralyze them or subdue them. And in, in defense, as you may be familiar with, with social species, such as as um, social wasps and, and bees, uh, social bees, that they can be used in defense uh, to defend a colony or a hive. So um, from this aculeata, we can then see that there's a number of super families. Now, there are eight super families globally, and we have seven present in the UK with an asterisk, and I'll explain why in, in a little bit. Um, and you can see these across the bottom. Now, just to define what we mean when we say some of the different common terms associated with this group, I'll start off with um, wasp. So a wasp is any apocritin excluding the ants and the bees. 
So all these ones in bold are all wasps. But if we were to say stinging wasp, that would be the aculeata excluding ants and bees. Uh, another term we may have heard is solitary wasp. So this is starting to think about uh, solitary versus social. So that's um, all of the apocritans excluding ants and bees and also excluding some of the Vespioidea, which have evolved higher degrees of sociality. And then a final term, term we might have uh, heard is hunting wasp. So this is talking specifically about aculeate wasps, which high hunt prey and then have some form of preparation or handling or dealing with uh, processing of that prey. So in case of most of the hunting wasps, that's stinging it to paralyze it and then moving that um, prey, paralyzed prey, uh, back into a nest cell. And that could be wherever it's nesting and then laying in an egg on it, sealing it up and then leaving it to develop. In the case of the sun, the social wasps, which are also hunting wasps, um, that handling is actually killing the prey and then chewing it up into a some kind of um, segment, uh, normally a thorax, which is full of uh, muscle protein, sometimes abdomen, and then taking back that protein parcel back to the nest and feeding directly to larvae. So um, aculeate wasps, uh, they're a diverse bunch, uh, both in their in their kind of appearance and form, as you can see here, a huge uh, range of size. And um, we have here our largest uh, UK species alongside one of our smallest. Um, but also they're very diverse in their biology, um, where they live, um, when they occur, what kinds of hosts they're interacting with, the kind of ways they're interacting with their hosts. So it's a really interesting group to study because you have this range of different biology. So in terms of the different ways they obtain their prey, I've already spoken a little bit about uh, the hunting wasps, which are um, going out, finding their specific prey and processing it in some way. Um, but we also have uh, kleptoparasites. So these are wasps which are then letting another species do all the hard work for them. Um, and then they will then find that provision, break in and lay their own egg. That egg will then hatch and consume all of the provision which was um, produced by the, the host, uh, as well as killing and in many cases consuming the um, host egg or the host larva that was in the cell as well. Um, but we also have um, within the culiata um, parasitoids. So the parasitica aren't just the, the parasitoids, the, 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 the non-aculia apocritans. And we also have parasitoids within the aculeata, and they are, again, laying their eggs on, on the host and developing, usually as an external ectoparasite. And then diversity of nesting. And we have lots of different uh, ways in which uh, places that they will construct uh, their nests and provision for their offspring. So the majority of them will either be aerial cavity nesters or fossorial ground nesters. Uh, in terms of aerial cavities, they will nest in um, a whole range of different, um, any kind of nook or cranny um, where they, if it's about the right size, um, then there's a chance that there'll be species living there. Uh, this typically tends to be holes in deadwood, like old beetle burrows, or um, hollow plant stems. So things like umbellifers and bramble are our favorite um, nesting sites for, for some cavity nesters. And then the ground nesting species, um, naturally, most of these will be associated with uh, looser, sandier soils because they're easier to dig in. Um, but some species do um, nest in, in more clay rich soils and more thicker um, soils. And then there are some species, and globally there's more species which do this, which actually construct a, um, a complete nest themselves. So they're not putting it into a cavity, whether that's in the ground or, or um, in a tree, they're actually building the nest. Um, so some of these do this with, uh, with mud, um, particularly clay rich muds. And uh, in the Sphacidae family, there's lots of species worldwide. Uh, in the UK, we, we don't have uh, very many at all, actually. It's just um, the Eumenes, really, which do this, uh, like this um, Eumenes quartatus, the, he the Heathland Potter wasp, um, with this amazing photo from John, uh, where you can see it's, it's built the um, this pot on the left. 
um, and then it will then proceed to provision that with with caterpillars and then lay an egg and each pot it builds will actually only have one egg inside it and then we of course we have the uh, the paper nest of the social wasps um, so these are created by mulching wood, um, dead wood, um, and different stages of de decay are preferred by different species. But generally, they'll, they'll scrape the wood, they'll mix it with their saliva, and then they um, create this uh, paper. And that was the inspiration, uh, as the story goes, for modern paper. And then inside, uh, you'll have uh, a comb uh, with lots of cells where, where the brood can be reared. And then over the top in the Vespinae, uh, there'll be a, a an envelope covering over that nest. And wasps are also diverse in where they occur. So um, unfortunately for people based in the north, the majority of the species that we have in the UK do tend to have a distribution like the one on the left, a starter boops, where most of the records occur in the south of England, particularly on the south coast. But there are species which also occur north um, and some only in the north. So a nice example of that would be the, the cuckoo social wasp, Vespula austriaca, uh, which is actually mostly a Scottish species. Um, and then there's also some very, very scarce or very restricted species like uh, Pseudopopona herichii, you see on the right, um, which can actually only found from, from a, a handful of sites um, in restricted area around the Isle of Purbeck. So if we want to um, have a look through different wasps, it would be quite helpful if we can think about the anatomy and, and, and know what kind of body parts that we need to be looking at to try and identify our wasp. So um, when we're trying to identify at a family level, wing venation uh, becomes very useful. Um, so if you see in, in figure three um, from, from the wasp of Surrey um, figure uh, here, um, two things which are really important to look at is the the marginal cell so on the leading edge of the wing up near the apex there's a cell this is the marginal cell that can be quite important um for, for differentiating different families and then behind that there will be one two or three submarginal cells well for species which have uh, developed wing venation some species have really simplified wing venation but um, we'll ignore that for now um, so yeah, knowing um, and counting the number of submarginal cells uh, here can be really useful. Uh, other characters which are useful to look at um, potentially are the, the pronotum. So this is kind of just behind the head, uh, like the shoulders, um, and there can be different characters on this to look at. And then also the propodium. So this is at the back of the mid body. Now, this is actually the first segment of the abdomen. So if we are talking about the, the gaster, the, the bit around the back, uh, if we call that the abdomen, that wouldn't technically be accurate. I mean, it doesn't really matter. No one's ever going to kind of kind of be bothered by that. But technically, that's actually the, the metasoma. Um, and then the abdomen is actually starting in the, in the mid body. So how can we recognize aculeata from all of these other Hymenopteron. Well, there's fortunately some really nice characters which can help us. Uh, the first of which is just to check that it's got the wasp waist. So it is a true apocritin and it's not a sawfly lookalike. In fact, some sawflies are mimics of um, aculeate wasps, very good mimics. But if you look, you'll see that they won't have the wasp waist between their mid body and the end body. Um, whereas if it is a, an aculeate, it should have this nice wasp-like waist. Uh, the other thing um, that can be helpful to differentiate aculeates is the antennae. So they will have uh, between 10 and 13 segments in their antennae, whereas a lot of other wasps, um, particularly the ignimonids, uh, will have many, many segments um, in their antennae. Uh, so you see like the one on the right here, you can see loads of uh, segments all the way around. So just having a quick look at the antennae, uh, you don't necessarily need, even need to count them. If you can just see that there's absolutely loads or there's about 12, then that can help tell the difference. And then another character which can be really useful to tell some of these uh, parasitica, which look really similar, is has it got a long ovipositor with an ovipositor sheet poking out the end? Now, sometimes aculeates, particularly if they're, if they're dead, uh, the stinger will be poking out. But this is just a, like a short little um, implement 
Whereas an ovipositor, if it's a species that's got a big long ovipositor, then you know that that's not an aculeate. And then when we know we've got an aculeate and we want to start uh, identifying it further, um, there's a few different things that can be helpful to look at. Um, so the first thing is to remember that these are hymenoptera, so they're really sexually dimorphic. The males and the females for lots and lots of species look really dissimilar. Um, and it's all to do with the uh, things like the fact that they're haplodiploid, so the males are actually have half the amount of chromosomes because they're produced from unfertilized eggs. But I won't go get too bogged down in, in that. Um, but an easy way is for, for most of the aculeates, um, the males actually have an extra antennal segment. Now, there are some key exceptions where the males and the females have the same number of antennal segments, but for most of them, uh, that is a, a difference. And also the um, the abdominal segments, which you can see um, for most of them, the males have an extra visible one, whereas the females, they have more internal uh, segmentation. Um, but also just generally looking at the colour can be really useful um, to see, um, is it all black? Has it got a bit of red on it? Is there whites? And we can put them into categories based on, on the predominant colour scheme. Um, and then something I always remind people not to forget is, uh, if we're out and we're seeing these things um, uh, out in, in situ, then don't forget to think about the context. You know, what kind of habitat are you in? What is the wasp doing? Have you seen it nesting? Have you seen it with prey? That can be really useful uh, to help uh, narrow down uh, identification. And then the wing characters, which we've already looked at. So these are the uh, super families of um, wasps that we have in the UK. Um, so as we saw earlier, there were um, seven um, super families of Aculeata in the UK, but of course the ants, um, that entire super family is just ants, so we'll exclude that here. Uh, whereas the bees fall within the Apioidae, but there are lots of wasps there. Now, um, it seems quite simple here, however, it was complicated somewhat in about, I think it was 2015, 2016, where there was a, a revision of the Crabonin, uh, Crabonidae, um, whereby uh, several uh, subfamilies were raised to full families. So the actual picture looks a little bit more like this. Um, so we have these extra families of um, apoid uh, wasps. Uh, but in some ways that's helpful as well. So now I'm just gonna go through um, each of these uh, families and um, talk about some of the little tips and, and tricks um, to, to help us recognize them. So this isn't like a, a, a systematic, comprehensive way of identifying that. We can use keys to do that. These are just like little features that we can look out for to help us to shortcut, uh, perhaps even in the key, right? Just to get to the right kind of ballpark. So the first superfamily is the Chrysidoidae, and the first family is the, is the namesake, the, the Chrysidae. So these are the jewel wasps, or sometimes called rubitail wasps, or sometimes called cuckoo wasps. So lots of different common names for this group. Um, but one of the nice features of them is that they're very metallic. These are probably the most beautiful wasps. In fact, I'm just going to say these are probably the most beautiful insects, maybe even the most beautiful animals. They are just absolutely stunning. And they're not uh, uncommon either. If you have um, a bee hotel or trap nest in your garden, then there's a good chance you may well have seen this. You may well have just seen them anyway. Um, so if we have a, a, a culet wasp, which is very metallic, then uh, we could be thinking, OK, this might be Chrysididae. Um, another feature they have is they have a strong uh, coarse punctuation on their, on their thorax and their head. Um, so that's another indication it's Chrysid. Uh, they also have a reduced number of uh, abdom visible abdominal segments because they have more internal segmentation. Um, so we normally, you wouldn't see more than five. It's normally four um, or three that you can see. And there's two subfamilies um, in the UK. There's the uh, Chrysidinae, which are kleptoparasites of bees and wasps. Um, so these are the ones you'll see around the, the bee hotel and they're, they're going for um, some of the wasps which nest in those cavities as well. Things like Anchistrus cerus, um, which has been uh, hit by crisis. And uh, the Kleptonae, uh, these are a little uh, less common uh, and these are parasitoids of sawflies. And then the other families in the Chrysidoidae are these three weird families. Um, so sometimes called the Debs, um, Dryanids, Embolemids, and Bethelidids. Um, and these are 
actually much more scarcely recorded. Um, I think they are under recorded, but they're also you don't come across them that much. And that's to, to do a little bit uh, because they're quite small, most of them. It's also to do with their lifestyle. So a lot of these um, spend a lot of time um, down in the soil or under bark. And um, so you don't come across them that much. If you do mass um, trapping with like a malaise trap or pan traps, then sometimes that can turn up some of these um, or looking in habitats which uh, hymenopterists don't normally look in. So I know that a lot of beetlers actually find bephylids quite often because they're looking under bark and the kind of places where the bephylids live and the, the people who are looking for wasps are probably not looking there. So the bephylids are, are quite small, dark uh, wasps, uh, and they quite often have this um, dorsal ventrally compressed. They're, so they're quite flat, like someone's dropped a book on them. And that's all to do with help them moving around in the habitats where they live. Um, then we have the, the dryinids. Um, these, these are uh, funky looking things. Uh, they're uh, black or, or reddish brown. Uh, but the females have these really uh, interesting um, four tarsus, um, whereby... Um, it's chele, so it looks almost like a lobster claw. Um, so that's really distinctive on the female. They also have this weird kind of extended um, thorax and kind of neck, and they're parasitoids of um, uh, hemiptera um, leaf hoppers and, and, and plant hoppers. And then we have uh, one species of the Embolemiidae, um, Embolemius rudii, and uh, this is. Um, uh, another weird looking thing the female is is completely apterous um and it parasitizes uh tree root feeding uh bugs and it's um, almost certainly kind of subterranean so it doesn't come up much but it's really distinctive because it has this triangular head so you have the antenna coming off the front the mouth down the bottom and then this little beady eye in the middle so it's um it's quite distinctive when you see that little face looking up at you so on to the next uh, super family. This is the Vespioidae, and this is only has one family in it, which is the Vespidae. So these are uh, all the social wasps and the paper wasps. Uh, there's three different subfamilies in this family in the UK. Uh, we have the Potter wasps, which are nesting either in the ground or in aerial cavities um, and using um, kind of clay or mud partitions to separate off the cells. Uh, then we have the uh, paper wasps. So these, uh, well, we have four species recorded from the UK. Uh, none of them are established natives. Um, they are periodically introduced or, or turn up potentially under their own steam. Uh, some of them even persist in, in locations for, for a few years, but um, there's no kind of long running established populations yet. Um, and these, these um, build um, paper nests, as the name suggests. Uh, but these don't have an envelope, so these are open exposed nests. Quite distinctive, so like a little stalk with the comb hanging off. Um, and then the final um, subfamily th is the Vespinae, um, so these are the social wasps, uh, sometimes called yellow jackets for, for some of the social wasps. Um, and these um, have a range of sociality um, globally, but uh, in the UK um, they're mostly um, eusocial. Uh, there is a one species of, of uh, brood parasite as well, like with the bumblebees. And uh, these are building uh, paper nests, which are with a full envelope. And this family actually has this really handy feature to help us recognise them quite easily. And all we have to do is look at the wings uh, because they all have this character where the wing folds in half longitudinally, so lengthways. Um, so it gives us a kind of um, quite angular, almost like a fighter jet like appearance, like you can see on all, all three of these photos here. So if you see those those folded forewings at rest um, and, and it will do it quite often after after death as well. And then you know that you're looking at a, at a Vespid. And at this point, I just wanted to mention um, the Asian le yellow legged hornet. Um, it's been uh, bit of focus of attention uh, in, in the media this year. Um, so it does look like it is established in the UK now. And um, we have had 49 confirmed sightings this year. Um, in the previous um, seven years, we had a total of 23. So between one and nine uh, sightings every year. 
Um, but yeah, lots of records. Most of the ones this year um, have come from uh, the southeast, uh, particularly Kent. So it looks like it's actually overwintered um, around there. So potentially there was nests which were missed last year. Uh, and then all of those um, nests which have been found have been uh, destroyed. But it does look like it's here and, and it probably is going to be here to stay. Um, so look out for it. it it does in some ways look similar to our native hornet, the, the European hornet, but there are some key characters which can help us tell the difference. Uh, the first of which is probably the easiest if you look at the, the feet. So the tarsi on the Asian hornet are bright yellow, which gives it the name, whereas on the native uh, Vespa crabro, they're brown. Uh, also looking at the front of the um, the metasoma, or the, the first uh, sternite, uh, tergite, sorry, um, that, that will be dark, whereas in the Vespa Crabro, that will be brown uh, and the head as well. Um, it has uh, tends to have a dark head, um, but that is variable. OK, so uh, next superfamily is the Pompliloidae, um, and this has uh, three uh, families within it. So the first of those uh, that we'll cover is the velvet ants. Uh, so the name comes from the fact that the, the females in this group are wingless. So they look a little bit like ants and you quite often see them running around on the soil like ants. Uh, but you look more closely and you see that they're clearly not ants. Um, they don't have elbow dantenni. Ants have elbow dantenni. And they don't have the multi-segment petiole that ants have. So if we look at the constriction between uh, the propodium and, and the gaster, we can see it's just a normal wasp waist and it hasn't a... a two or three segment um, or modified petiole, which, which the ants have. They're also a lot hairier than ants. Uh, and that, in fact, is one of the useful characters we can look at, particularly on the abdomen. So velvet ants uh, have this bands of hairs on the abdomen, which is a really helpful way uh, to tell that it isn't a velvet ant. Uh, so we have two subfamilies, the mutillinae, which is... Um, parasitoids of, of bees and wasps. Um, in fact, Mutilla europea will actually uh, parasitize uh, bumblebees. And then the uh, Mimosinae uh, with one species, which is a kleptoparasite of uh, thesaurial uh, nesting bees and wasps. And then the, the largest family in this superfamily is the namesake, the, the Pompilidae. So these are the spider hunting wasps. These are really cool wasps, um, really uh, one of my favorite groups. Uh, so they all are um, attacking, hunting spiders, sting them, paralyze them, and then drag them back to um, their nest. Um, there's a couple of exceptions where they actually they they will just use the spider's nest, um, but they're quite scarce. And um, generally, they'll they'll drag them back. And an easy way to recognize uh, a spider hunting wasp is they've got really long legs, and this is to help them deal with the spiders. Of course, spiders themselves are predators. So if you're going after a big, bad predator, you've got to be pretty big, bad yourself. So those long legs help them kind of keep the spider at bay until they can bring their stinger to bear and uh, sting it and, and, and begin paralyzing it. Um, it also helps them move really fast as well. So if we see a really long leg wasp um, and it, with long tibial spurs, so at the um, apex of the tibia, they have these long spurs, which again is quite characteristic. Um, there are other species of uh, other groups of wasps which have long legs, which can have quite long spurs as well. Um, but there'll be some differences. So uh, if you look at the uh, um, antennae, make sure it is an aculea and not one of these long legged, uh, long spurred igneumons, which can look similar. Uh, but also the behavior. So spider hunting wasps are really active, but they tend to run more than they walk. Uh, so you see if a, a wasp running around really fast, um, that can be an indication. And also a lot of them do this wing flicking behavior. So if you see the wings flicking out, then uh, that's also a, a characteristic um, of uh, spider hunting wasps. And there's three subfamilies in the UK. Uh, the Seropalinae are um, only one genus, which is um, certainly less common than the others. Um, and then we have two um, subfamilies with, with quite a few, all, all the rest of the genera in, and they are more widespread and common. Uh, but fortunately, there's some really simple characters that we can use to help recognize which subfamily it belongs to. So the first, the Pepsinae, they have this groove on the second sternite. So if you look at the underside of the of the abdomen, the second sternite has this folding, almost like a, a bit of paper that's been folded up, this groove. 
Uh, so if you see that, then you know you're looking at a uh, pepsin A. Um, and then the pompillin A, they have a wing character. So if you look at this cell in the in the wing, it has um, a kind of extension, which looks like a little pocket at the bottom of the wing. So if you see that pocket in that cell, then you know you're looking at a pompillin A. And this is really useful because a lot of them look really similar to each other, even though they're in a completely different subfamily. And then the final family in the Pompiloidae is Sapigidae. So there's only two species, Sapiga and Monosapiga. Now, the first is, is quite common and you may be familiar with it, especially this is another one which hangs around bee hotels. Uh, and then the, the second one, Monosapiga, is, is much uh, more scarce. And these are kleptoparasites and these ones are going on the bees in the, in the bee hotel. So things like Osmia. Um, but they're quite easy to recognize um, because they're quite distinctive. Um, both the species have quite distinctive markings, particularly Sapiga, uh, which has um, these red bands at the base of the abdomen and then five white uh, spots, which is where the name comes from, Quinque punctata, meaning five spots. Um, but that's only the female. As you see on the right here, this is the male of the same species, which looks quite different. Um, but it still has the overall appearance of uh, Sapiga. Uh, they've got three submarginals in the wing, uh, and then they've got this distinctive antenna where the antenna gradually thickens as you get towards the end. So if you see this thickening antennae, that's a really good indication that it's a Sapigid. Next superfamily is another superfamily with just one family in it in the UK, which is the Typhoidae uh, and the Typhoidae. Uh, there's three species in two subfamilies. The first subfamily is the Mephocinae. Uh, this is just one species, which is Mephoca, which is the coolest species. Um, it's it's so tough. Um, so it's a parasitoid of tiger beetles, um, specifically tiger beetle larvae. And if anyone knows anything about tiger beetle larvae, they know that these things are vicious predators. They they dig a hole and they wait for ants to run past, and then they uh, burst out and and grab the ants in their big jaws, and and then pull them down into the hole. Now, this wasp has actually evolved to have a, a thickened thorax to deal with that huge jaws of this thing. And then as the larva's grabbing it, it bends round and it stings it on the soft part of its neck, basically the, the thoracic segments um, just below the hard head capsule and then paralyzes it, then drags it back down into its own hole and then lays an egg on it and eaten alive. So yeah, very cool wasp. Uh, the female is completely... Uh, Apterus, so it looks a little bit like a velvet ant. Uh, we can tell it's not an actual ant again because it doesn't have the elbow antennae and it doesn't have the petiole features of an actual ant. Um, and we can also tell it's not a velvet ant because it doesn't have those bands of hairs on the abdomen. It's relatively hairless. And then the other subfamily is the Tiffinae, um, and there's two species of Tiffia in this, uh, Femorata and Minuta. Uh, these are both parasitoids of dung beetles. They, they dig down um, into dung beetle um, nest cells, uh, break in, um, and then um, sting the, the larva, lay an egg. And actually, the, the, the larva of the dung beetle will all cover uh, and then um, begin kind of resume feeding on the dung um, until the egg hatches and then the wasp feeds on the, uh, the poor dung beetle larva. Uh, so, uh, these are quite small. Minuta in particular is quite small, um, but femorata uh, tends to be a bit bigger and tends to have reddish legs, although you can get small femorata with black legs, which can confuse um, with minuta. But fortunately, there's some other characters on the propodium which we can look at, which I won't go into now. Um, but a key feature of this whole family is that they all have two submarginals in the wing. Um, so if you saw a male uh, Mephoca, which has wings, or if you see a Tiffia, um, you can tell it it's only got two submarginals in the wing. And then with the Tiffia, um, they have this kind of characteristic shape to the, um, the gaster, whereby uh, the first um, tergite is, is kind of narrower than the second, and it's got this kind of stepped increase. Um, and that, that other wasps do have this feature. But that combined with the general overall appearance um, and the two submarginals can be useful to tell that it's a tiffidae. The next uh, superfamily, I almost didn't put in the talk because 
Um, there's only one family with only one species, actually, that we have in the UK. And this is only known um, from the Channel Islands. And I don't believe there's that many records from there anyway. I did see someone um, here this evening who was from the Channel Islands. So you'll have to go out and look and see if you can find this species or maybe you already have. Um, but this is um, Scolia. Uh, these are really cool wasps. They're really interesting looking wasps. Um, very distinctive markings, and um, they quite often have bright coloration spots and, and patterns on them. But they also have these darkened wings uh, with apparently a corrugated tip, which I, I haven't actually seen. Um, but yeah, so we have just the one species from the Channel Islands there. And then onto the final super family, um, but the one with lots of different families in, uh, we have the Apoidae. Um, so the first family uh, in this is the Specidae. Um, so these are quite large uh, wasps and they have a, a really long um, petiole. So it looks like a, a stalk, which the abdomen is uh, kind of the rest of the abdomen is sitting on. So if you see a, a kind of large elongate wasp with a long petiole, then uh, it's a good chance it will be a Specidae. Now, there's, there's, there's eight species of, from four genera, but um, Svex is um, only known from the Channel Islands again. And Isodontia has only recently arrived, actually. This is a um, North American species, which has turned up, and you can now find it around uh, London. And then the ones that we're most likely to see are Amophila and Podolonia, uh, which are sometimes called sand wasps. Um, and if you're still not sure based on the size and the long petiole they also have um two apical spurs on the uh on the on the middle uh tibia whereas other wasps which have a long petiole uh they'll have uh one apical spur and um amophila and podlonia are going for large lep larva the, the other two are going for orthoptera um and now we're into um the group of families which used to be within the Cribonidae, um, but now families in their own right. So the first one is the uh, Startidae, so there's only three species, although one of them, Dinatus, is only known again from the Channel Islands. You see a, a pattern, a theme emerging here. Um, but the other two are Startaboops and uh, Dryodella pinguis. Um, a starter is actually really interesting because it's had a, a big range expansion recently. It's turned up um, a lot more places. Um, and both um, Astarta and Drydella, I mean, they all, all this whole family are uh, hunting uh, bugs, but Astarta and Drydella are going for the shield bugs, um, or Pentatomoidae, uh, the super family of shield bugs and allies. And um, a nice way to recognize these, I mean, they have three submarginals, um, but the males of Astarta and Drydella have really big eyes. Um, that kind of meet on top of the head. Um, almost, it looks a bit like a male honeybee, if you know what that looks like, or like a, a helmet, if um, if you're not sure. So if you see some a male with their big eyes like that, then you know it's a, a starter day. The next family, uh, Melididae, has, uh, well, two species, but uh, Crabineus is presumed extinct. So really one species, which is uh, Melanus arvensis. So this is a really quite common and um, widespread species. So it's a really useful one to get familiar with uh, because you'll probably find it. Um, it hunts medium sized uh, flies, uh, things like hoverflies and, and houseflies and blowflies. Uh, quite often, actually, you find it hunting around uh, dung. And um, it's, it's quite distinctive once you kind of recognize it with the particular patternings of yellow and black. Uh, but another useful feature is if you look at the face, uh, it's got yellow markings along uh, the inside of the eye. Uh, so if you see those, that's a good indication that it's um, melanous. Um, sometimes these meet together as like a U shape um, around the eyes and across the top of the mouth. Uh, but it doesn't always have this. Uh, the next family is uh, Crabonidae. So these are all the ones which weren't taken out and given their own families. So it's um, it's quite a big family and it's a very variable family. Um, generally, most of them uh, actually only have one submarginal, uh, which out of all of the um, UK families, these are the only ones with one submarginal. So if you see a wasp with one submarginal and it's um, a stinging wasp, then it will be a crabonid. Um, although there are a couple which have uh, two and, and three respectively. Um, and yeah, these are all doing um, 
different stuff nesting in the soil nesting in cavities hunting all different sorts of different types of prey from from flies to to frips to 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 bugs uh, even um uh, grasshoppers and, and spiders uh, the next family is the Bembicidae. Uh, so there's 11 species here. Um, they are hunting um, leaf, hotter, leaf hoppers and plant hoppers, all those kind of uh, bugs, um, unless they are kleptoparasites. Uh, so Nissan has become kleptoparasitic on other uh, wasps in, in this um, family. So these are kind of medium-sized wasps uh, with free submarginals. Now, they do look... To me, at least, I think they look quite similar to the potter wasps that we saw earlier. But as you see, they their wings don't fold in half like a um, like a potter wasp would, because the potter wasp is a vespid. Um, so if you see something that looks a little bit like a vespid, but the wings aren't folded, then uh, you might want to think, oh, is it a bembicid? Um, and then we can look, and if you look at the marginal cell in front of the submarginals, um, then that should be uh, pointed or or kind of cut off. Um, and it, it shouldn't it shouldn't have uh, be split into two with a little mini triangular accessory cell at the end. And then the next family is the Philanthidae. Uh, so the six species in, in two genera. Uh, so five of those are Cerceris. Um, so these are the Michelin man um, wasps, because if we look at the um, the abdomen, you can see that the the Tergites um, have uh, this ribbed appearance, um, which is really distinctive uh, to see. And and the Cerceris, they hunt uh, mostly weevils, generally adult weevils. Uh, but there is one species, Robiensis, which would actually hunt small bees, uh, helicted bees. Uh, and then the other one in this group is the bee wolf, uh, Philanthus. Uh, so this is quite a large wasp. Um, and it's quite distinctive looking. Um, you see the kind of banding black and yellow. Um, but it has a very yellow face, which is quite a useful character. I think uh, the antenna look kind of quite unique to me, at least anyway, the kind of shape of them, almost like a feather in the overall outline. Um, and then large females have brown markings behind the eye on the back of the head. So if you see that as well, then you know it's a uh, bee wolf. Um, the Cerceris also have quite yellow faces as well. Uh, so that's quite a useful character. And again, this family has three submarginals. Uh, next family is the Pemphrodonidae. Um, so there's quite a few different species here, but they're all generally um, small, dark wasps. Uh, some of them can get quite large, like um, Pemphrodon lugubris. Um, and in general, they're hunting equally small prey. So they're going for either aphids or frips. Um, but the really nice character with these wasps, uh, some of them are petulate, some of them aren't, uh, but that doesn't matter because they all have two submarginals, and that's quite uh, unique. Uh, so if you see a wasp with two submarginals um, and it's an uh, apoid, then uh, then it will be uh, pemphrodonid. And then the final family is the Senidae. Uh, so there's uh, 13 species here. Um, although sen is uh, presumed extinct. And these hunt hoppers, aphids, and psyllids. And these are generally, again, quite small wasps, quite dark, although some of them do have uh, red markings at the base of the abdomen. Um, but all of these have petulate abdomens. So this is another one where the abdomen's on a stalk. And the mid-tibia has one apical spur, which would differentiate them from the specids that we saw earlier, which would have two. So if you see a small wasp with a petulate abdomen and three submarginals, then that will be a senid. So hopefully now um, you feel reasonably confident to identify an aculeate wasp to the to the family level. Um, if we want to take it further and, and get stuff to, to species level, then here are some resources that I can point you to to help with that. So the first of all is Bee Wars and uh, specifically the Bee Wars website. Um, it is a kind of aging, creaking website and we are aware of some problems with it. We, we are actually getting a new website, although I'm not sure when that will be. Um, but the, the current website is still there and it still works. And I still would uh, point people towards it. 
and it's fantastic because it's got full uh, species accounts for, for all of uh, the UK species, uh, which have all information on um, their, their biology, you know, where they occur with up, up, up to date maps, um, as well as their, their phenology, um, their uh, host associations, their parasite associations, um, some um, all have uh, images and uh, some have uh, identification features as well. Um, in terms of identification, we also have the UK Bees, Wasps and Ants Facebook group. Uh, for those of you on Facebook, this is a fantastic uh, friendly group uh, where if you post a photo um, within seconds, if not minutes, uh, you will have a whole load of very helpful experts who will help you uh, identify um, whatever it is you've, you've, you've uh, found. Uh, I'm also happy to, to um, look at stuff myself. Um, I have people sending me photos all the time of wasps, which are very enjoyable to, to go through and help people work out. Uh, in terms of literature, uh, currently at the moment, um, the books I recommend um, are the uh, Solitary Wasp um, book by uh, Yeo and Corbett. Um, it's a little bit kind of... Um, out of date with some of the reorganization of, of some of the families and some of the genera but it's still a very useful useful resource and um, there is a new uh, guide to the apoid wasps being worked on um, by um, Mike Edwards et al um, but that's not um, out yet and um, that will be a fantastic resource uh, for identifying apoid wasps uh, when it's eventually released that will be a, a race society book like the um, Elson Edwards bee guide then for the um, Vespoid wasps, so this is the, the Vespidae and then a few other families, uh, there's a really good um, RES key um, by Archer, uh, which is quite useful for identifying those, as well as um, regional um, books. Um, so, for example, Wasp of Surrey, um, absolutely fantastic book, um, not just applicable to Surrey. Many of the um, species in there are much more widespread than just Surrey, so it uh, can be informative wherever in the country you are. Um, and then there's a whole raft of online resources as well. Um, so Stephen Folk has put um, a few wasps onto his excellent Flickr resource, um, which can be useful. Um, and then I've also been developing my Flickr uh, similarly with with a few wasps on as well with all with them um, verified uh, vouchered photographs so uh, they are of the species that they purport to be of so once you've identified your specimen uh what then well we'd love for that record and um, so what is a biological record well it's simply a species so what where when who so we like to know where it was, um, ideally with a six figure grid reference or better. And there's some fantastic tools, uh, free tools uh, to help you uh, work out grid references. Um, we'd like to know when um, in the format of, of day, month, year, um, and also who, uh, who was it who, who, who saw this species and, and generated this record. Um, with species names, um, ideally we would like to an up-to-date concept because our understanding of a certain species does change through time so we are developing and bringing in the iso concept which is in the sense of so every species record will be an associated with an iso so this species according to our understanding of it at this point now it is um, a little bit complicated and if you don't understand it don't worry um, but there will be some resources um, which will be produced in the future to help people explain what ISO is and how they can use that to increase the value of their records. So that's essential stuff. Uh, it's also useful to know um, the determiner. So did someone else uh, actually identify uh, the specimen as well as if there was a voucher um, taken, uh, any information about that is really useful. And if possible, uh, the vice county name and number, because then our system can automatically check that that matches up with the with the grid reference. Um, so once you've got all these fantastic records, what do you do with them? Well, if you have a lot of records, then the easiest way is probably to email them straight to the data team at BWARS. Um, so you see the emails there. Um, but if you have a few records or you have a more casual recording um, every now and then, then you can just pop those straight onto iRecord. If you've not signed up for iRecord, I really encourage it. It's where we um, direct people to submit um, all our records for, for bees, ants and wasps. 
uh, really uh, user friendly tool. I just want to say uh, thank you to everybody uh, for for joining this evening. Um, I also want to thank uh, Jeremy Early, John Walters, Alan Cornish, and Louise Hislop for for the, some of the photos, lovely photos that I used. Um, and yeah, uh, my details are here. So if anyone has any uh, questions, um, um, but feel free to to ask them now. I'm, I'm happy to hang around for a little bit and answer some questions. Uh, and also, yeah, you can you can contact me on the uh, on screen address. Okay, um, thank you so much, Liam. Um, yeah, that that was a that was a really great introduction and, and really well rounded too. Um, and uh, yeah, I I didn't know that um, there was a a parasitoid of, of tiger beetles. Um, I mean, I've I've seen them. I've, I've stuck sticks down there, <laughs> so they are they are really quite vicious. And uh, you know, yeah, I, I'm I'm surprised the audacity of any wasp to to have a go and, and evolve to um, try and yeah to <laughs> to to do what they can do is yeah is is very impressive. Okay, we'll go over to questions then. Um, and I do apologise for any of the pronunciation because these are not all English names. So I'll just go with the first name, actually. So the first question was from Dilrukshan, and it's just asking whether the metasoma is the gaster. Listen. Mm. Um, basically, yes. Yeah. It, I mean, as with any kind of uh, thing, it's all semantics and terminology. But yeah, it's the 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 metasoma is the the if you've got three chunks, it's the chunk at the end. Okay, great, thank you. And then and then another another question from Dilrukshan. Um is I I naturalist popular in the UK? Perhaps more now, very broad, of course, but there are there may be special projects. Mm. Yeah, um, people do use iNaturalists in the UK. Um, we don't recommend people to use it with BWARS um, just because we take our data through iRecord instead. Um, there are some some nice features on iNaturalists. There's also some issues with with the with the data and, and, and how it's verified, which means it's not really uh, we're not able to use it. Um, so for getting a, the records into iRecord uh, um, is, is kind of our preferred method. Right, thanks, Liam. Okay, um, uh, a question from Steve Dixon. Do you have any book recommendations for ichneumonids? I know of the Natural History Museum guide. Mm. Yeah, um, there's not there's not a lot. Um, nothing jumps to my head immediately other than the new RES um, handbook um, on ichneumonids, which is amazing. Yeah, I, th I think um, our, our colleague um, at um, World Museum in Liverpool, Tony Hunter, he 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 obviously uses that great new RES book, but he, he has to refer to lots of uh, little papers, basically, that are, that are describing different species or giving little keys to, you know, very particular groups. Mm -hmm. I think you have to have quite a wide range of, of, of literature to be able to cover the majority of them it's a big family <laughs> yeah m massive um okay so and, and i don't and i don't think there's anywhere that i know that really lists or you know all of those mm. particularly um i mean there's the and, and the only national recording scheme i know of is is the nocturnal ichneumonist which is run by gavin broad and there'll be mm. a There'll be a literature list on on his website, um, which there is one. I think if you just type in nocturnal ichneumonid recording scheme, you'll you'll get to that quite quickly. Okay, a question from um, Hans: Are the different hunters hunters species or genus specific in their choice of prey? Oh, so are they are the hunt are they yeah. are the hunters species or genus specific? Um generally species specific. So different species of wasp in the same genus 
will take different prey. So a really nice example uh, which came up in the talk would be Cerceris, where um, you have Ribiensis, which is going for bees, and then same genus, um, uh, the other um, um, Cerceris going for, for weevils. And um, different species of the other ones will go for different species of weevil. Right. And, and, can, and can they be so specialist that they only go after one species or do they have to be a bit broader than that? Usually. Um, well, some some of them are, yeah. So think about like the bee wolf, for example, that's just going for honeybees. Uh, that's one species. Yeah. Um, and then you have other ones which are more general. Um, so like a starter will go for a range of different shield bugs. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, a question for, from Neil Barker. Hi. Are the Asian hornets really dangerous to UK wildlife or are they only really of concern to honeybee keepers? Um, well, the the simple answer is we don't know yet um, because it is a, a new species, even though it's been in France since 2004. Um, even there, the, the research is still under, ongoing to work out the impacts on native species. And there's been some, some really interesting work done in the last uh, kind of year or so. Um, where they take uh, gut contents. Um, so they collecting nests which were being destroyed and they took advantage of that, took out the, the larvae in that nest and dissected out their gut contents to see what they'd been fed by the adults. And then you uh, met a barcode. So you grind it up and then you extract all the DNA and see what species are in there. And it was a really wide range of different things. It even had um, a head job and fish and stuff so they they are opportunistic uh, generalist predators like the rest of the family uh, the subfamily and um, so most wasps and hornets um social wasps um will be generalist and opportunistic however the, the asian hornet they they will target honeybees when the opportunity presents itself so there is um some evidence that they um, they have a, a big detrimental impact on bees and they could be causing colony losses. But it's really difficult to prove that as well, right? Because there's so many factors affecting a, a colony of bees from the weather to local uh, chemicals in the environment to to a series of, um, of, of rainy days and type things or, or just flowers not growing uh, where they were growing last week. Um, so, yeah, trying to work out the effect is very complicated and an ongoing work, but um, we're trying to work out as fast as we can because it's here and it's going to be spreading. Yeah, thanks, Lee. That's really interesting because they do get such bad press, you know, in terms of what they're going to do to our, to our bees. So, and, and the evidence, obviously, is it just isn't that clear. Mm. Thank you. So, okay. I mean, on the bright uh, side, that... we, could, we could think about um, Dolica vespula. Um, so we've got two species of Dolica vespula, which arrived in, in the last kind of uh, 10 or 20 years. So uh, Dolica vespula media um, and Saxonica. Um, so it's a different genus um, to Vespa, but it's kind of similar. Then it's a large generalist non-native wasp. And neither of those species, uh, there's no evidence for any detrimental impact on wider wildlife. Um, they don't have quite the same colony sizes as Vestiva velutina. Um, so that could be a difference, but that's kind of reassuring. Right. Thank you. OK, and then another one from Neil Barker. Why are Chrysidae so brightly coloured? <laughs> that's a good question. I mean, the, the physical answer is it's to do with the microsculpture on, on their um, on their exoskeleton, on the integument, which diffracts light. Um, but if the question is like why is in is 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 there a, a, a evolutionary reason? Um, I've got no idea. Maybe no one does. Okay, thank you. Okay, and then a question from Nick. So, is a start of boops the only shield bug nymph predator? Um, no. Uh, Dryudella also um well, goes for um, pentatomoid um, nymphs. Um, it's a slightly smaller wasp and it goes for slightly smaller shield bugs and, and is more likely to go for nymphs. Um, a starter, a little bit more likely to go for um, older, larger nymphs, just because the larger it can deal with and, and carry back, then the more food there is for the for the larva. OK, great. Uh, and then a question from um, Carol M. 
We have observed something laying eggs inside a cabbage white caterpillar, which later burst out and the caterpillar lays over the eggs. Is this some type of wasp? It is a wasp. Yeah, it, it's not a stinging wasp. It's not an aculia. It will be uh, an ichneumonid. Um, and I can't remember the name of the species, but there is a particular species which is really well known for parasitizing um, the, the white butterfly larva. I don't know if anyone else can remember. Yeah, someone stick it in the chat. I, I can't remember either. OK, um, and then a question from Vivian Russell. Hi, Vivian. <laughs> um, know you're from Cumbria. Do we get tiger beetle wasp predator in Cumbria? Uh, I can't remember the exact distribution. Um, I'll have to get back to you with that. <laughs> If you go onto the Beewolves website, uh, if you go onto the species profile, the up-to-date map will be there and you'll be able to see uh, the, 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 the spread. Are they attacking um, all tiger beetles? Obviously, in Cumbria, there's the mm. Synclinella hybrida, the, the June tiger beetle. You know what? I don't know. Um, the northern so June You, you tiger only beetle, find sorry. the wasps on... on the habitats where you find the beetles it's a very nice kind of overlap you know so you it's always heathlands um it's possible that the other beetles in the uk context at least are scarce enough that they're you know less likely to i mean sometimes they can be quite locally abundant um but yeah again i i don't know the specifics about that the the only thing i know about the wasp it's always been on a green tiger beetle campestris so uh, yeah Right, okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, a question from Mark Parkomenko. Apologies for pronunciation. Can you recommend any books or articles about the evolution of of Chrysidae? Um not Chrysidae specifically, but there are some really good books on the evolution of hymenoptera and insects more generally uh it depends if you're what what you're specifically interested in is if it's just overall evolutionary trends then there's some really nice um textbooks on evolution of insects uh, if you're interested in the specifics of the crisis then it will probably be more likely in, in some uh, articles um but i don't know of any uh, specifically okay thanks liam uh, another question from hans have um, you socialism evolved in any other lineages uh, apart from other than Vespidae? Yes, um, so it's also in the ants, um, and it's also in the apoids with the with the social bees, um, and then also outside of Hymenoptera, there's lots of uh, use social. So there's actually five different orders of insects have evolved use sociality, including frips. Uh, beetles, termites, of course, uh, and there's even some uh, eusocial crustaceans, uh, or at least some very highly social crustaceans. Uh, and then there is um, two species of eusocial vertebrate, um, the naked mole rat and the Darmaland mole rat, also uh, eusocial. Uh, so it is interesting how it, yeah, it, it has popped up at various points on the tree of life. Um, with the um, the Hymenoptera, a big driver of it is this uh, the fact that they're haplodiploid, uh, which means that you have a really high kin relatedness. So workers are more closely related to each other than they would be to their own um, haploid offspring, uh, because they're workers. They can't uh, they can't produce females. They can only produce males. Um, but yeah, there's some really fantastic um, research that was done on this and is still done on this. Um, it's quite mathematical but if you're into that kind of thing then uh, i definitely recommend looking into it that is impressive knowledge of you socialism thank you um okay a question from ruth barker sorry ruth baker is there a wasp that goes after ladybirds i found some zombie ladybirds with the thread balls underneath them is this yeah. a wasp or another culprit it's it's a wasp. It's a thing called Dinocampus coccinelli. It's an ichneumonid, or is it a baconid? It's it's one of those. Um, and it, it, yeah, it attacks the the ladybirds. Um, and then um, develops in inside them. 
and then when they're ready to pupate they um, emerge from the ventral side and then they spin this kind of yeah like you described like a fluffy ball of, of silk underneath and then the ladybird it's still alive uh, kind of zombified and it stands over this uh, nest uh, while the wasp is pupating and it will even kick and defend the developing uh, wasps and what's really interesting is that a proportion of them uh, the ladybirds then recover so as for after the wasp pupates and flies off the ladybird goes about its business wow yeah that's that's quite a common wasp isn't it yeah I mean, yeah yeah if people sort of look out for it um okay thanks very much Liam um question from Kieran Clark this is a bit of a longer one um not sure if this is the right place to ask this but I've collected collectids from the entrances to Ceres's ribensis mm. nest yeah. and only found more social species L. porxillium and yeah. and L. malacurum yeah. despite many other helictid species being present so if there are any information on the hunting habits of Ceresis mm -hmm. ribensis yeah so in, in general, host records are relatively scarce. We Most of our records uh, are just species occurrence records. Uh, so anytime we can get host data as well, that's fantastic. Um, so yeah, it's, Robiensis is it's an interesting one. Um, Poxilium and, and Malacurum are definitely um, two of the most commonly taken species. Um, there is um, mention in the literature that they tend to uh, preferentially target returning foragers, um, presumably for a similar reason to how the hornets hawk returning foraging bumblebee uh, honeybees, right? Because they're 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 less energy. They've just done this big exploit of going out to forage. They've probably got um, pollen load um, on them, so they're going to be weighed down. So they're probably just easier to handle. So that could be something to be why right? if you have these uh, more social species of lazy glossum uh, it could just be easier to take the the, the workers um, as as they come back that's my kind of yeah hypothesis but uh, not saying that's that's proven yeah, th thanks Liam um, okay another question from Hans um, tips for collecting solitary wasps traps mm. what sort of what traps would you might might use Absolutely. So there's there's lots of different ways to, to find them. Um, first is, is I'd say, is, is habitat. Um, so if there's any particular groups that you're going after, obviously you need to be in the right place. Um, open habitats, sunny habitats like heathland are fantastic for lots of different species. Um, also, deadwood can be really um, important for, for finding lots of, of species. Um, if deadwood in a heathland is amazing because you get loads. Um, and then um, you can do um, just kind of direct netting if you see something. Um, you, the advantage of that is you can also then observe it, see what behaviour it's doing, maybe see if it's, um, you know, what the hope, what the prey is or uh, if there's any parasites or attacking it in turn. Um, then it, for general sampling, also the more kind of dipterous style technique can actually be quite productive. So kind of just walking along, um systematically swinging your net back and forth you can actually pick up a surprising number of, of wasps uh, it was Stephen Falk who really um turned me on to that as being a really a way to efficient way to collect a large numbers um, and the key thing that he does is he extends his net handle so it's a little bit further away and then you pick up a lot more species that um you don't if you're sweeping closer to your body because they fly off before you get there they see you coming and then in terms of actual trapping, uh, pan traps can work really well, especially for things like pompilids, which can be quite difficult to just net or sweep because they dive down into the vegetation. But um, lots of species of pompilids have a propensity to, to dive into a pan trap. Um, and then malaise traps and vein traps or any kind of interception, flight interception trap can be really good to pick up some of the under-recorded small species. So some of the... Um, um, different groups like 
like tiffia and stuff uh, can can be easier to find in in malaise traps and as i mentioned the befalids as well um sometimes you know you'll get um and things where the females are apterous but the males are winged uh, they tend to be under recorded in general pretty much all of them um but then you can pick up males in a malaise trap Thank you, Liam. Yeah, great tips there. Um, okay, we have a, a looks like a possibly a final question. <laughs> um, okay, and as was the first one, this is from Dilrukshan. Um, is haploidopody haploidoploidy only in the Hymenoptera? No, there are other groups which have uh, yeah similar systems as well. Okay. Great. Um, okay, I just trying to see. Um, yeah, I think I don't see um any other questions forthcoming. And yeah, it's it's been pretty relentless for, for, for Liam there. <laughs> but yeah, you know, excellent, really comprehensive answers, which um absolutely pleasure. really helpful to everybody so it's, it's been it's been a great talk liam and yeah and, and a really interesting evening and um and yeah a very engaged audience clearly with the number of number of questions that they've that they put to you and and how well they did in the quiz so yeah we we're really grateful that you were able to do this um for us tonight um and it is going on youtube isn't it i think it's station for those who did book on and missed it or want to recap on um, some tips for identifying the different families of, of, of the UK species of, of wasps so I'm sure it'll be really useful um, for years to come so um, yeah hopefully um, you've all enjoyed this evening and maybe you're interested in other groups of um, invertebrates and maybe you'll come to other webinars or workshops or recording days that we're doing um, um, at World Museum and, and further afield. And I'm sure we we, we do um, in-person workshops on Hymenoptera every year. We normally do 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 a few. So look out for those and, and please do come up to, to Liverpool or at least the Northwest when we go further afield for those. Um, and yeah, and thank you again to Liam and everybody have a great rest of your evening.